Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this lecture on the direction of social change in the Philippines. Our guest speaker is Dr. I want to say Artemio. It turns out that his name is an anagram of Artemio, Temario Rivera, who is visiting us from Madison, where he is a visiting researcher in political science. He received his training at the University of the Philippines, where he is currently assistant professor. And he has a few other stars in his crown. He is a Fulbright Exchange Scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he has been since last November doing research. Uh, he is the interim executive director of the Philippine Resource Center at Berkeley, California. And he's the lead author of a collection of articles entitled Feudalism and Capitalism in the Philippines, which was published in 1982. And he's written some other articles on the political economy of the Philippines. Without further ado, so that I don't, as uh, Tony threatened, spend three quarters of an hour introducing a speaker who then has only 15 minutes left to speak, I give you Dr. Rivera. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Sonia. Uh, may I take this opportunity to thank the uh, ISU Socialist Collective for this opportunity to uh, share with you tonight some of my uh, observations on the uh, history of the struggle for social change in the country, and of course uh, the current developments in the country today, particularly after the ouster of the Marcos dictatorship. I uh, prepared actually a formal lecture here, but after discussing initially with uh, Tony and uh, the other members of the Filipino community who are around, and after having been apprised of the, <clears throat> the kind of audience that will be attending tonight's session, I decided to uh, present a far more focused discussion and a less academic uh, presentation for tonight. Uh, uh, I noticed that in the uh, title of the lecture series, you wanted me to uh, focus specifically on the direction of social change in the country. And so by, uh, I would uh, therefore present uh, a lecture, a very uh, brief lecture. Uh, I'll be more interested also in your comments later on the uh, direction of the current uh, movement, a movement for uh, genuine uh, social and, and political change in the country. But before uh, I can do that, I think it is also necessary, particularly for the benefit of uh, most of you in the audience who may not have uh, had that kind of uh, historical uh, background for a better understanding of the current developments. Now, since uh, this, is, this lecture series is being uh, officially uh, hosted, by the ISU Socialist Collective, I uh, was also requested to uh, <clears throat> discuss specifically how socialist thought and practice, the world over, have affected the struggle for change in the Philippines. And again, in a very general way, I would uh, attempt to do that uh, tonight. Well, you will recall, of course, that the Philippines was a colony of Spain for more than 300 years, from 1521 up to 1898 or thereabout, so that when one speaks of the history of struggle in the country, in the Philippines, a third world country like the Philippines, one must, I think, necessarily start from a proper understanding of the fact that we were a colony, first of, of the Spanish uh, Empire, and uh, finally, of course, in 1899 or 1898, when the U.S. decided to intervene in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War, when the Philippines also became a colony of the U.S. up to 1946. In short, 
Given the historical realities of a country like the Philippines, much of the current struggle taking place right now uh, has to be understood from this historical context. For a long period under Spain, for instance, there were several hundreds of peasant revolts, peasant uprisings, which took place in the country. Unfortunately, since these were uh, fragmented uprisings against the Spanish Empire, they could not succeed. But they will lead, finally, to the formation of a national anti-colonial revolutionary party, which uh, was which exploded into the scene, as it were, sometime in 1896. In 1898, the uh, Philippine Revolutionary Movement already succeeded in uh, winning political power from, uh, from the uh, Spanish uh, forces. In fact, we already established in 1898 the first republic in Asia. And we would have been the first republic in Asia to win a struggle against the colony had not the US intervened in 1898 in the aftermath, as I've already mentioned earlier, of the Spanish-American War. Again, I will not uh, bother you with details here, but, uh, well, what uh, uh, happened was uh, President McKinley uh, ordered uh, the forces of, General, of uh, Commodore or Admiral Dewey to uh, uh, engage the Spanish Armada in Manila Bay uh, in the aftermath of the uh, struggle which took place in Cuba. Now, again, I will make a long story short. The uh, Filipino forces, revolutionary forces, were made to understand that this was only a temporary maneuver on the part of the uh, Spanish, uh, of the American forces, who were in fact seen initially as some kind of uh, an ally in the struggle against Spain. But then, of course, the U.S. decided to annex the United States, the, the Philippines, and naturally the Filipinos resisted in a bloody three-year war which left more than half a million Filipinos dead in the bloody battles which took place from 1899 to 1901 when uh, the leading uh, general of the uh, Filipino Revolutionary Forces finally surrendered. The Philippines, in many uh, senses of the word and of the reality, was the first Vietnam, uh, as a matter of fact, for the, for the U.S. Now, much of the uh, current struggle taking place today is deeply entrenched in uh, two significant political movements in the country. One is the peasant movement. The second is the workers' movement or the labor movement. The peasant movement, for a very simple reason, up to now, close to 70% of the uh, Filipino population, of the uh, labor force, are either tenants or agricultural workers in the countryside. And therefore, any significant political movement must decisively address the problem of land. That was true under Spain, it was true under the American colonial era, it was true under the Marcos dictatorship, and it is equally true today under the new government of uh, President Aquino. And secondly, of course, we also have a long history of uh, a labor movement, a workers' movement, uh, which dates back to the turn of the century, particularly when uh, foreign commercial and uh, trading uh, uh, enter enterprises began to establish uh, branches in, uh, in, in Manila and in the uh, other major urban centers of the country. Uh, 
In fact, I would like to specifically uh, uh, stress the contribution of the workers' movement in the development of the revolutionary movement and the revolutionary struggle in the country because much of the uh, political leadership, the ideological leadership of the current movement today draws from uh, the very long history of uh, the workers' movement in the country. Again, I will not uh, bother you with uh, details here. I will simply outline what I think are the most uh, important uh, features in the development of the workers' movement in the country. And just to preface this discussion, in the context of the Philippines, when one speaks of socialism, by the way, there can at least be four historical points of references for understanding socialism, both as a theory and as a political movement. One has to do with the uh, fact that uh, in the 1920s, in 1929 to be exact, there was indeed a socialist party, but unlike socialist parties as we really know them in the Western advanced capitalist countries of the world, this socialist party was peasant-based. It was a thoroughly peasant-based party uh, under the leadership of uh, an enlightened uh, lawyer from a very prominent landlord class. So again, you can see here the very complex dynamics taking place. Socialism, but yet peasant-based, not workers-based, and in fact being led by uh, an intellectual from the landlord class. The Socialist Party in 1929, uh, if we are to draw historical parallels, uh, would probably be closer to the so-called uh, SRs, or the Social Socialist Revolutionaries, during the time of uh, Charis Rush, during the Charis uh, Rush, during the, uh, the, the period of uh, Charism in Russia, Charis Russia, and also have very strong anarchist trends, uh, especially of the Spanish vintage. Yeah. That, that is one, uh, one historical reference for socialism in the Philippine context. But the Socialist Party, which was peasant-based, was absorbed in 1938 by uh, the Communist Party, which actually, when one speaks of the socialist struggle in the Philippine context today, uh, would best, I think, uh, refer to the struggle under the leadership of the, uh, of the Communist Party. You know, much of the, uh, well, not only much, but historically the political and the ideological leadership of the revolutionary struggle since the 1930s had really been uh, provided by the uh, local Communist Party of the Philippines. Again, we can look into that later. A third point of reference for the concept and the practice of socialism would refer to uh, parties and groups that are coming from the uh, Christian democratic tradition in their attempt to shape a socialist uh, future, but uh, making use of, uh, social, uh, of Christian democratic uh, theory and practice. And a fourth point of reference for our understanding of socialism in the Philippine context has to do with a, uh, a very recent development, actually, a new uh, left-wing party which openly calls itself this time a socialist party. But since it's a very new formation, it came out only formally in 19, uh, 1986, as a matter of fact, after, shortly after the ouster of the uh, dictatorship. It's part of the, uh, the left-wing movement. Uh, these are all uh, important and significant uh, aspects of the, for understanding the concept and practice of socialism, but in my presentation for tonight, I propose to limit the discussion to the main and the most significant historical point of reference for the socialist struggle, which is the revolutionary struggle under the leadership of uh, the local Communist Party uh, in the Philippines. So again, to, uh, just to outline very briefly the uh, important developments uh, to uh, help us understand better the current situation, the, uh, the revolutionary struggle, as I already mentioned earlier, of course 
is deeply rooted in the, uh, both the peasant and the workers' movement in the country. A peasant and a workers' movement which are also rooted in the colonial as well as the anti-colonial and the post-colonial history of the country. The radicalization of the workers' movement in the country uh, can actually be dated, interestingly, I just found out uh, in my uh, recent researches, to as early as uh, the 1900s, when the first formal labor union was established in 1902. It was established, in fact, by uh, Isabella de los Reyes, who is sometimes referred to as the father of Philippine socialism. He was a uh, militant uh, labor leader who was in fact imprisoned in Spain for his uh, trade union activities. He was involved in the, uh, he was involved and he was strongly influenced by the uh, syndicalist and the anarchist movements in Spain during his time. And when he came back to the Philippines, he established the first formal union. The first formal union, again, interestingly, was uh, almost composed entirely of uh, printers, printers uh, working, uh, yeah, printer, workers in in uh, in the printing houses established in Manila and uh, the adjoining area. And I think this is one again, if we are to compare the formative years of the development of the uh, radical movement in the Philippines. One interesting uh, fact stands out, and this is the fact that unlike the experiences of many of the uh, radical revolutionary movements in other third world countries, and even in the case of the advanced uh, Western capitalist countries, where it was usually the intellectuals, the intelligentsia from the property classes, who were decisive in the formative stages of the movement, in the Philippine case, interestingly, the core of the, uh, the founding personalities and leaders, as it were, of the radical movement, in fact, were drawn, was drawn from a core of self-educated workers directly involved in the trade union movement in the country. The founder of the local party, Communist Party, for instance, was a guy called Crisanto Evangelista, who was, in fact, a uh, self-educated pipesetter in one of the printing shops in Manila. The, uh, the coming in of the uh, radicalized intelligentsia from the property classes would uh, take place at a later stage in the history of the movement, uh, probably uh, in the late, as well, the earliest that I could date it would be the late 30s, when, uh, well, we, we can go into that later, but I just wanted to uh, pinpoint what I think is an important uh, fact in understanding the, uh, the history of the radical movement in the country. Uh, the role of the workers' movement and particularly the role of uh, the educated and the radicalized workers in the development of the revolutionary struggle. No? As I already told you, side by side with the working class in the Philippines, there existed also for a long time, going back to the colonial Spanish times, a very strong peasant movement. And in 1929, as I mentioned earlier, there was in fact an attempt, well not only an attempt, there was in fact a party, it was called the Socialist Party, established in an attempt to articulate the sentiments and the aspirations of the peasantry. Now in 1938, a very interesting event took place. The local party, Communist Party, and the Socialist Party formally merged. Now, this was an important uh, development with far-reaching political implications because it now means that you had a local communist party which was based in the urban centers and the workers. Now, you can imagine in the 1930s, the working class was a fairly small sector of the population uh, given the backward economy then. 
So this formal linkage and merger with the peasant-based socialist party provided the movement with, uh, well, an enormous uh, political and organizational reach by succeeding in linking itself, in fact, with the most numerous exploited and uh, oppressed sector of Philippine society. Oh, by the way, I may as well, uh, again, just to uh, go, uh, go back a little bit, out of the radical workers' movement would finally emerge the, uh, of course, the, uh, the Communist Party, which was formally founded in 1930 by uh, self-educated workers like Crisanto Evangelista. Uh, a few months after its founding, the colonial government uh, reacted swiftly by uh, arresting its uh, officers. And in fact, a year later, declaring the party an illegal organization. So from about 1932 to 1938, it, uh, by force of necessity, it was forced to work underground. And it was not until 1938, with the coming threat of uh, the fascist uh, militarist regime, in the case of Asia, it was the Japanese threat. This threat provided a political opening by which the uh, government, uh, in fact, and other sectors initiated some kind of a uh, modus vivendi, a coming together for political uh, reasons between opposition parties, including the illegalized communist party. So what the government did was, uh, in fact, to say, well, we have a common enemy, Japan, in the case of Asia, in, in the European context, it was uh, fascist uh, Italy and Germany. And uh, because of this political opening, the party was allowed to uh, operate once again uh, openly. The uh, leaders who were arrested uh, earlier were freed. And uh, well, there was, uh, and, and the merger took place between the party, the, the, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party. But this was a very short-lived uh, experience in open political legal work. Again, in the context of the U.S., I suppose it's very difficult to visualize the demands of uh, working clandestinely, uh, but it's fairly routine in many of the third world countries like the Philippines, where uh, the, the usual uh, liberal parliamentary rights are generally, even if uh, they were uh, present in the formal constitution were not generally uh, implemented and respected. So this was a very short-lived experience because in 1941, the, uh, there was a Japanese invasion. And again, to uh, just to focus on the most outstanding developments uh, as far as the radical movement was concerned, in the struggle against the Japanese uh, invasion of the country, which started in 1941, the uh, Communist Party, through its peasant mass base, succeeded, in fact, in establishing the most disciplined and the most dedicated guerrilla resistance uh, struggle against, uh, against the Japanese. The Hukbalahat, the People's Army against uh, the Japanese, was established. And uh, again, what happened was in the course of the struggle against the Japanese, the landlord families naturally fled the countryside. And this provided, this left some kind of a political vacuum which enabled many of the peasant organizations to literally take over uh, the government and the local administration of many of the, uh, of the barrios. The barrios would be the, the barrio would be the uh, smallest political units in the country. This was uh, a very, uh, I think, uh, important experience because for the first time, even if only for a very short period, we had the experience of the popular empowerment where people, in this case peasants, ordinary people, were actually running the affairs of their own government, their day-to-day -day affairs in the context of the struggle against the Japanese. 
Well, this was from 1942 to about 1944. The uh, American forces, of course, uh, under General MacArthur, uh, came back. The famous uh, I shall return uh, promise of General MacArthur. And unfortunately, the government, which was uh, basically, which was based on uh, the interest of uh, what we may uh, refer to as the big landlord class in the country, with the aid of the Ameri returning American forces, forced the dismantling of the uh, of the peasant army, not only forcing its uh, dismantlement, but also its the arrest of many of its leaders, and in some cases, the uh, outright massacre of its peasant uh, supporters in Central Luzon, for instance. I'm not trying to uh, briefly uh, follow the uh, ups and downs of the revolutionary struggle in the country, as you can see. Now, when, in 1946, when uh, the, uh, the United States decided to grant formal political independence to the Philippines, uh, the government, which was part of the arrangement, the political arrangement, also began uh, the practice of holding regular electoral parliamentary elections. Elections for the presidency, elections for Congress, as well as elections for the local, uh, local officials. Now, in 19, sometime in 1946, again, a very important event took place because uh, the uh, Revolutionary Party decided to test the limits and explore the possibilities of parliamentary struggle. In other words, trying to see the viability of the electoral parliamentary practice. So what the party did was to initiate the formation of a legal political party running its own slate of candidates, and not surprisingly, because they had a very strong peasant base, they won, actually won, uh, some seats, if I remember right, about uh, seven or eight congressional seats in Congress. Now, what happened, however, was the government conveniently uh, fabricated the uh, charge that these members of the opposition representing the uh, party of the, uh, of the peasants and the workers could not, be, uh, could, could not be seated in Congress allegedly because of uh, electoral fraud and terrorism. But the real reason, of course, was the fact that there was pending during that time a very controversial amendment to the Philippine Constitution, the so-called Parity Amendment. This amendment, which was subsequently passed by Congress after the expulsion of the opposition congresspersons, provided American nationals, remember that this was, this was already at a time when the Philippines was supposed to be a formally sovereign and politically independent country, but here, yet here was this amendment in effect mandating the, con the, the country to provide equal rights to American nationals to exploit the natural resources of the country. The notorious uh, Parity Amendment approved uh, in 1946 or 1947. Now, uh, th there was therefore a very short lived and a very negative, uh, for very uh, real reasons, very negative experience with parliamentary practice. And uh, when the, uh, the peasant and the worker uh, base of the radical movement became a uh, continuing target for repression, the radical movement decided uh, sometime in 1949 to launch its armed struggle against the regime. An armed struggle against the regime, reactivating its guerrilla units and launching, uh, well, armed attacks, obviously against the, uh, the, uh, the government. But, uh, well, we know what happened in spite of the uh, vigorous uh, peasant base, 
The U.S. intervened massively, providing uh, financial, material, military support to the government, and uh, succeeded, and the government succeeded in crossing the uh, radical armed struggle, armed uprising. By 1951, the, uh, the armed struggle was basically crushed. The leaders were either under arrest or effectively immobilized. And uh, the uh, guerrilla military units by the 50s had disintegrated, and those that uh, survived really degenerated into nothing more but uh, some kind of roving rebel bands bereft of any ideological or political guidance by the party, which was already in disarray by that time because of the uh, crossing defeat suffered in the 50s. The 50s, in fact, uh, the progressives in the Philippines would refer to the 50s as the uh, the Middle Ages of the uh, of the movement. The, the movement was in complete uh, political and military retreat, and uh, for a long time, almost for the decade of the, the entire decade of the 50s, uh, the uh, both the peasant and the workers movement uh, were literally in the back burners of uh, Philippine social and political life. Now. As in many countries of the world, the 60s, the decade of the 60s, however, provided a completely a new experience, again for various reasons in the context of the Philippines. To begin with, there was a, uh, an intensifying economic crisis, which revived the mass movement among the peasantry and the workers, but more importantly this time, something which was not true of the earlier stages of the movement, a new sector of Philippine society began to serve this time as the focus of radicalism. And this was the students and the intellectuals based in the university. The 1960s, the early 60s, uh, for instance, uh, this was uh, something which uh, I could speak with a little uh, more uh, personal, uh, with, with some kind of uh, personal experience. The, uh, what basically happened was uh, there emerged a new generation of radical intellectuals based in the universities, particularly in the state uh, university, the University of the Philippines. Now, the leadership, the core of this uh, new generation of radical intellectuals, decided to launch what they called a thoroughgoing critique of the weaknesses of the old movement, and at the same time waging a thoroughgoing, what they referred to as a rectification campaign targeting why the old movement failed, what were its weaknesses, and hopefully trying to overcome these weaknesses. And uh, again, uh, we can, I need not go into very uh, complex details here about uh, debates and polemics about the weaknesses and the, uh, the errors committed by the old leadership, but it was found out basically that uh, what was needed was uh, a leadership that could once again effectively link up, recreate, regenerate the mass movement that had been in the doldrums for the, for the entire decade of the 50s. So the student activists, as it were, served as the vanguard for initially making these linkages with the workers and the peasants activating old organizations, activating all the, the, the old and the veteran cadres. And finally, of course, this new generation of uh, radical intellectuals decided in 1968 to uh, 
to establish, in effect, a new party. This was in 1968. A few months after the establishment of the new party in 1968, an important thing took place. Remember that earlier I told you about the few struggling guerrilla units operating in the countryside, many of which had already degenerated into some kind of roving rebel band without any political direction or leadership. The new party succeeded in linking up with this young guerrilla commander. And uh, in the classic words of one author uh, discussing this event, the par and here was a party in search of an army and an army in search of a party. These two finally coming together in 1969. And so we have the beginnings of the new People's Army in 1969. Well, again, we know that in 1972, after uh, during his second term of office, Marcos, uh, President Ferdinand Marcos, uh, decided to declare martial rule in 1972. And uh, in fact, under the old constitution, his term of office would have ended uh, during his second term. But uh, by declaring martial rule, he succeeded in perpetrating himself in office up to, eight, up to 1986, for a period of, what, uh, almost 16 years. Again, let me just uh, outline the uh, most basic developments. Uh, the radical movement, of course, with the studentry as the initial uh, center for developing the mass movement, uh, spearheaded the long resistance against the dictatorship. And, uh, well, we know what happened, uh, again, to make a very long struggle uh, to just to telescope many of the events that took place under the dictatorship. The uh, long history of popular struggles against the regime, popular resistance in the countryside as well as in the cities, erupted finally into a massive people's uprising, and of course, also uh, a military mutiny against the regime in 1986, which resulted in the ouster of the dictatorship. Now, uh, let us focus this time on the, more, uh, on the current situation after the ouster of the dictatorship. You will recall that uh, the coming into power of Mrs. Aquino was really the product of uh, several contradictory political forces. On the one hand, there was a faction of the military which withdrew its support from the dictatorship and decided to support Mrs. Aquino. This was one faction of the military headed, it used to be headed anyway, by uh, the old the defense minister of Marcos, uh, Mr. Enrile, who is now a senator, and uh, the former vice chief of staff of the Philippine, uh, of the, uh, Philippine Army, General Ramos, who is now the defense minister, currently the defense minister. So that is one faction of the uh, coalition that supported Mrs. Aquino's coming into power. A second important faction was made up of big business with, uh, of course, uh, linkages with uh, big foreign capital. A third faction was represented by the conservative hierarchy of the church. And a fourth faction would be represented by the broad, popular, people's-based organization. Now this, of course, as you can very well, uh, as you can see, is a very explosive and a very contradictory relationship where you have groups and individuals drawn from various political persuasions trying to uh, come together in a political coalition. Again, what 
basically happened since 86, when Mrs. Aquino took over, as uh, those of us who have been following up the events would probably know, was the increasing breakup of the coalition until, of course, uh, Mrs. Aquino has finally, I think, uh, if we are to read the latest developments, uh, effectively, in effect, allied her herself with the uh, more conservative faction of this coalition. Increasingly, what has happened, in fact, was a situation where the popular-based movement that initially supported Mrs. Aquino began to be disillusioned by the indecisiveness of the new government in confronting the fundamental problems of the people. More importantly, land reform. What happened with land reform? As we can very well see, uh, the land question had been at the forefront of the long struggles in Philippine history. The, uh, the peasants are very well organized up to now, in spite of the repression that they have been uh, that they have been subjected to, and they naturally expected uh, the new government to effectively address the question of land, and for the new government to come out with a decisive land reform or an agrarian program. Well, through the indecisiveness basically of the presidency, Congress was allowed to uh, come out very recently, in fact, uh, about three months ago, with, a, uh, with, an, with an agrarian reform bill that is so drastically watered down that no less than the author of the bill himself in the lower house decided to withdraw his sponsorship and his signature from the bill because well, according to him, it got so mangled that it looked like it was uh, a landlord, uh, it was in, in effect a landlord uh, reform bill with uh, its uh, so many loopholes. And up to now, of course, the, uh, the peasant organizations are opposing and uh, resisting the attempt by the new government to implement what is a drastically uh, watered down uh, version of a land reform bill. Human rights uh, cases, again, just to again uh, briefly enumerate the more basic problems. I'm enumerating this because, uh, just to backtrack a little, the revolutionary radical movement, in fact, during the initial months of the new government, decided to enter into a ceasefire with Mrs. Aquino's government to explore the possibilities of uh, a political solution and a political negotiation to the problem. Well, the uh, agenda presented, of course, was uh, for the ceasefire to hold. The government, at the very least, must effectively address the land question. But as I've already mentioned, it failed to do so. And not only that, uh, there were, in fact, several cases of outright massacres of peasant demonstrators and activists. I wish I could show it tonight. I brought with me a uh, video cassette tape, in fact, uh, showing the, uh, a very, uh, one of the massacres that took place under the new government, the so-called Mendiola massacre in 19, uh, what's that? January of 87, when uh, peasant demonstrators were uh, openly fired at a few meters, in fact, uh, just a few meters from the presidential palace. Yeah? So the government was not obviously giving the right signals to uh, the popular movement. And uh, much of the uh, disenchantment initially had to do with this, the failure to resolve the land question. Secondly, the government, uh, after the breakdown of the ceasefire with the uh, New People's Army and the National Democratic Front, the National Democratic Front being the broad coalition, underground coalition of revolutionary groups and organizations, when the ceasefire broke down, it was a two-month uh, ceasefire, the government decided to wage what it called an all-out war 
against uh, the insurgents and the revolutionaries. And to complicate things, the government, together with the church, also sanctioned the formation of uh, what we call in the country today as the vigilante right, right-wing death squads. These are really, uh, in the countryside, what the military did was to arm, provide arms to uh, groups of uh, individuals who are either religious fanatics and, uh, of course, uh, anti-communist, or to uh, the, uh, the bullies and the toughies in the, uh, in the barrio, provide them with arms, and uh, under the excuse that these are spontaneous, voluntary people's organization, well, you can imagine what happens when you provide arms to uh, religious fanatics and uh, young bullies and toughies in the neighborhood and literally provide them the complete uh, license to go after anybody who is suspected as a communist. And much of the recent killings in the country, in fact, aside from the uh, systematic military operations going on in the countryside, have been uh, committed by this uh, vigilant right-wing death squad. Uh, again, many of us in the Philippines uh, view this step as a uh, move that further escalates violence. And in fact, uh, by uh, but at the same time, it also provides 